and so I would I would contend that there is no gospel in the culture in Italy. I think that the biggest obstacle people face when engaging with Christians is that a lot of people just don't know one. I think it's probably about 2% of the population of the UK would be evangelical Christians, um, Bible believers. In fact, 83% uh, of Czechs will say God doesn't even exist. Uh, and, and here there's a very small evangelical population. Um, it's, it's maybe half a percent evangelicals. There is a great opportunity for us as Christians. Now the sad thing is, they're not coming to the Christian church and knocking at the door and asking that question. So they don't expect the Christians to give answer. Christianity, Jesus Christ as he's presented by churches, just all looks to be part of the old way of doing things. That the decline in churches means that roughly three quarters of the population of the UK has no church background and cannot conceive of ever going to church. The church in Germany in general, the evangelical church, is small. Germany has only less than 2% evangelical Christians. Because there's so few uh, believers for such a large nation uh, and so many communities that are empty and void uh, of gospel witness and light, sadly the church is quite fractured. The vast majority, they have no idea uh, what the gospel is, uh, they have no idea about the biblical uh, truth of the gospel. And so they, they, they look at life as just, that's it, it's just existence. Most people just think Jesus is irrelevant. Um, there is incredible ignorance, people don't know who he is, just factual ignorance. If you ask a German, uh, you know, what, what happens if you die? Uh, many Germans have a problem with that question because 40% of the German population are pragmatic atheists. They don't believe that there's anything after life. Um, this was once regarded as a Christian country. We now have a, a generation where I guess it can be kind of typified by the statement made by Prince Charles a couple years back where he said in his view he doesn't see the monarchy and the role of the monarchy being the defender of the faith but rather the defender of faiths, plural. Generally speaking the culture here tends to look at uh, the gospel or as Christianity is, is almost a like been there done that we tried that as a culture we uh we, we we were a christian nation at once and maybe there were some benefits but we've we've moved on beyond that and so sometimes when you're talking to people they've they've kind of already made up their mind they think they know what you mean when you say this is jesus um around here people are good um they're good neighbors they they look out for one another they would say well you know i'm I'm not as bad as most and I'm better than some. And, and the culture would be, I, I don't need Christ, I can look after myself, I don't know who he is, religion is pretty irrelevant. We tend to find that we need to deal with people's personal experiences in that, that, that find ways for them to be able to, to feel or sense the reality that this world is broken, that their lives are broken, and that they need Jesus. And before you can do that with people, they don't see a need for redemption, so redemption doesn't really make any sense. And having said that, there's a lot of interest in the occult and spiritualism, and people like to dabble, but the idea of a, a God who might make claims on your life just feels irrelevant to people. As a generality, there's probably two main barriers in my mind. Um, I think one, the reduction of the content of the gospel, and then two, the cultural disconnect between the true gospel and where people are at. So in terms of the reduction of the content, I think that the prosperity gospel being so prevalent and the notion of health, wealth, and happiness being the goal of the gospel rather than the glory of God, it's such that it, it caters to and um, promotes the covetousness of the, the, of the sinful heart. And so that becomes very appealing. And then in the, the, the light of that, the truth of the gospel that we're guilty before God and we're sinners and um, are in need of his mercy and grace in order to be redeemed and to be saved, 
that doesn't really communicate well because people don't want to hear that they're wrong people don't think that they're wrong they just want to get better and have a, a better situation um, but then on the flip side I think that for those who do hold fast to the gospel the truth of the gospel uh, a very Christ-centered and biblical view of the gospel there becomes this issue of cultural disconnect so a lot of people just don't know a Christian if they do they don't get to see Christian interaction because they don't necessarily know many so that the apologetic for the gospel that by the love you have one for another all men will know you're my disciples people don't get to see that that interaction you know I'm not I'm not one to say that the gospel needs to be made cool I'm not one to say that the gospel needs to be made relevant how can the gospel not be relevant to all people all people die <laughs> all people face judgment so the gospel is already relevant inherently to all people but it's just a matter of the way in which it's communicated and lived out. I think Christians feel like their faith is irrelevant. So people aren't interested, they're not asking questions about, about the Lord. And people feel like people aren't interested. They feel like when they do try and say something about Jesus, people just don't want to hear or are confused. And, and in, a, in a sense, it sometimes feels like opposition or disagreement would be better. It's not uncommon here in Europe that we we see so little. Ministry can feel like it's hard work. You're working long days, you, you're caring, you're loving people, you're caring, your heart's broken for lost around you and you don't see much fruit. Um, and, and it's learning to be discontent with that, but content in Christ, rather than finding my identity in my ministry. And I think there is a lot of pastoral collapse, a lot of guys who have given up on prayer, given up on their personal devotional lives and it's scary the state of of pastors' hearts, I think, in, in the UK and in Europe. The average person that you meet on the street doesn't think of things in a redemptive way. Uh, and so they, they, they look at life as just, that's it, it's just existence. Um, and so when you, when you talk about redemption, when you talk about uh, the reality of Jesus coming to uh, overcome what's wrong with this world, um, they're not sure that that can be done or if it even needs to be done or if it is going to happen anyway except for by natural processes. And of course, this is the land of Darwin. And so you have sort of philosophical Darwinism that is the survival of the fittest. Uh, things evolve naturally. They happen as they happen. And so that's kind of ingrained in the culture and the philosophy of people. Historically, Geneva has something else distinctive about it, and that is that it was the city of the Reformation. So it's, it's, it's talked about as the, the Protestant Rome in that sense, that it's the centre uh, of the Reformed Church. Then with the history of the Reformation and the way Calvin reinterpreted scriptures, that Geneva became a centre of banking. But that, that's made it a wealthy city. And I think the wealth, as much as anything, influences the, the way people relate to the gospel. Uh, and in that context, and, and historically I suppose, it's quite a new context for the gospel to be presented in where people have the wealth to make choices, to, to make decisions. And the sense of, of depending on God and the, the urgency of the gospel message perhaps loses some of its sharpness. So you will find in Geneva, I think, a lot of philosophical interest in the gospel you know, who is Jesus Christ? What does his message mean for us today? On the radio, on the television, you will have these debates. The sense of our absolute rejoicing that Christ has come to save us from our miserable existence is a difficult message for people to get when their existence doesn't feel very miserable. You know, let us save you from, from your sins. Well, actually, I'm quite happy the way my life is at the moment. So, so there's that dichotomy. I think Christianity is respected. And this may be part of the broader picture that you find in Europe because of the long history. So many of our institutions are, are come from Christian principles but were brought in by Christian people. And there's that sense of respect and feeling, well, we are Christian in the way we do things. But that, that life-transforming power of the gospel just seems somehow one step removed. And, and that perhaps is the challenge for our churches.
how do we, we touch the lives of people who are living sophisticated, busy, well-educated, well-financed lives? What is redemption in that context? What is salvation? What is it we're saving people from that, that we see is so terrible? Um, that, that, that's a challenge for us to, to find a way of transmitting that message. But interestingly, it's, it's almost identical to the challenge faced by the reformers back in the 16th century, who were living in a world which was changing rapidly, a world of new wealth, of, of, of trading with the new world, <laughs> your new world. Um, but was bringing in wealth, the class structure was all being changed because of the new money coming in. Um, science was changing, people were, were looking out at telescopes and finding the earth is not the centre of the universe when the Bible, it was thought clearly taught that it is. So all of that was going on and, and the reformers had to go back to the scriptures and say how do we communicate this life-changing message in a way which makes sense to people living in this culture uh, and, and it seems to me we, we're facing very similar challenges. So it's an exciting time but it's that, it's that time of transition where Christianity, Jesus Christ as he's presented by churches just all looks to be part of the old way of doing things and the new way seems to be moving in different directions. It's about capitalism, it's about wealth, it's about comfort and security in that sense. The church was run and financed by the state as was common in, in much of Central Europe for good reasons that, that it was felt that the church is such an important part of society we can't just leave it to individuals, and, and so the state funded it. Um, but, but that did lead, I think, to a certain way of thinking within the church, that, well, the, the church will always be there for us. You know, that there's not the, the, the sense much stronger in the states, I think, that if we want a church, then, then we are the, the hands and, and the, the purses of the church. We have to make it happen. That's our calling. And that's quite a different mindset from, well, the church is one of the institutions, it's always there. And yes, it's where I go to worship and it's where I go to be taught. But there isn't the same sense of urgency that it's my responsibility to make church happen. So, so that's a that's hundred years ago that's changed. But they're still, in a sense, grappling, I think, with that mindset uh, of the assumption that the church will always be there. It's, it's not a question. Well, one thing I try to remind my congregation of frequently is that you know, Christianity, the Christian church, is growing faster in the world today than it ever has. That's predominantly in, in Africa, Latin America and in Asia. And I keep reminding people of that because there is this sense in, in our churches in Europe that we really are struggling and, and everything's declining and you know, financially we're under pressure to keep things going. And it all can feel such a burden. And when it becomes a burden just to keep the church going, to keep the, the flame of witness alive, then the energy that you really want to have to be going out and, and welcoming and, and reaching people in and, and spreading the gospel, letting it radiate out, that there's not much energy left for that sort of thing. When it all becomes a burden and how are we going to pay the bills and, and you know how are we going to get uh, new people onto our management committee when half of them are leaving this summer and all, all these things can sort of feel like a burden. And we have to keep reminding ourselves, and I think that's where connection with the wider world is useful, that actually the church is growing, it's vibrant, there are people doing great work, you know, there are people still all the time discovering the gospel and finding their lives changed by it. Um, because if we were just to think about Geneva, if we were just to think about Central Europe, yes, there are congregations which are growing and which are doing great things, but they're not the norm. You know, the overall pattern is, is of congregations getting older, um, getting smaller, struggling to to, to keep the witness alive uh, and the danger is that that burden takes over and, and blocks off our vision of what the gospel is. In the Czech Republic where we live, um, it's considered by many people to be one, to be one of the most atheistic countries on earth. So very high percentage of people don't believe in God, have no religious affiliation. In fact, 83% uh, of Czechs will say God doesn't even exist. Uh, and, and here there's a very small evangelical population. Um, it's, it's maybe half a percent evangelicals. Uh, so we live in a very secular atheistic society, one where very few people believe in God. 
Christianity has been in check for a long time. In fact, there was a Reformation here that predated uh, the Reformation in Germany under Luther. In fact, for 200 years there was a, a thriving evangelical church in this area of the world. But then it was re-Catholicized by the Habsburgs. They came up and, and took it over again in 1620. And, uh, and then came, uh, much later came Hitler, the communists, and so most people would, they know about religion, they know about Christianity, but they would associate it either with a, uh, a foreign empire that's trying to, to oppress them, or with uh, empty churches that are across the country. In every city you can find cathedrals that are beautiful, but today they're museum pieces. So most Czechs, uh, particularly young Czechs, when they think about Christianity, they think of some grandmother who's shuffling into a, a large church where only 20 or 30 people are there. Uh, they think of something outdated. Uh, they, they also would think about cults because that's what hits the news. Something dangerous, fanatic, um, uh, something's going to happen to you and you're going to drink Kool-Aid and die. They, they still would think those kinds of things. Uh, but they have very little exposure to, to a living, vibrant faith that would be expressed in, in this young contemporary generation. Under communism, the church really had a fortress mentality. It was all about uh, how do we protect what we have and not lose it. Uh, even in the era of youth ministry, any youth ministry that went on was for children of the church trying to keep them from getting lost. And so when the walls fell, uh, they, they kind of, it's like kind of like climbing out of your fortress and, and reaching out. And the first years after the fall of communism, here in Czech and, and maybe across the region, there was a huge wave of evangelism. You could go on the street and just preach the gospel and draw a crowd and people would respond. Uh, it was like uh, all the seed that was in the soil suddenly got water and began to sprout. And so in this area of the world there was huge re revival. There were churches that grew to seven, eight hundred people in two or three years, which is just massive for this area of the world. Lots of people came to Christ, but uh, they really weren't prepared to disciple and care for them. And so with many of those churches, if you fast forward it five or six years later, a lot of those people were gone because there were not trained workers to, to care for them. And so I would say right after the revolution, there was this huge, really revival. And then came a period of real disillusionment uh, at the end of the 90s uh, because they saw lots of people respond and then lots of people fall away. And I think the church was very discouraged. Uh, in the 2000s, uh, the first year, the, the first stretch of the, of the 2000s, I would call that a period of real stabilization. I think a lot of the churches worked on getting their buildings in order, strengthening their staff, and, and, and kind of uh, get, getting things stabilized. And uh, for the most part, the evangelical churches are, I would say, healthy, uh, but, um, but much more passive than I wish they would be. And my concern right now is that, is that harvest time has come again, but it's a different kind of harvest. And my concern is that the church not sleep through the harvest. If you ask the question, are they trained and equipped? I would say absolutely. Um, can they do it? Absolutely. Probably the barrier would be uh, more fear and, um, and just timidity. When they, when they reach out and um, or they reach out evangelistically, they tend to do it very well. So I would say it's not a lack of training. It's not a lack of resources. It's mostly um, faith, courage, um, perseverance, those kinds of characteristics that uh, that's what really, really pushes the gospel forward. Sometimes it's hard when you, when you haven't grown up in a certain culture to, uh, to fully appreciate the kinds of pressures that come from growing in a certain environment. So if you, if you just think here in the Czech Republic, since 1620, there's only been two periods of time where they haven't been under oppression. So one of them was between World War II and World War I and World War II, not a long stretch. And the second one is since the fall of communism in 1989. So think 1620 to today, two small 20 year stretches where you're not under communism. Now just think about that in terms of how that shapes a, a culture. And, and so that, that really impacts uh, the confidence of people, the cultural confidence of people to move forward courageously into new things. There's some strange paradoxes to the atheism of the Czech Republic. Uh, I think they can be summed up in uh, one, one writer here said, um, I'm, I'm such a strong atheist that I'm afraid God will punish me for it. And you just hear that paradox in the statement that uh, there's, a, there's a sense of God doesn't exist, but I wonder what he's like.
Well, you, when you think about Germany and uh, describing the Germans in their mentality, it's very hard to do because uh, Germans, they, they, you, don't have, you have stereotypes, of course, of Germans, but uh, Germans don't like to be uh, stereotyped or, or it's very hard to nail them down or say this is typical because Germany is very diverse. Uh, 82 million people living in our country and in, in, in nine countries bordering us and all these countries influ uh, influ influence us in our way how we live, how we see life, how we, our mentality. In our region where we live, we, we live very close to the French border, Luxembourg. Uh, people here, this was always kind of a poor area. There was always uh, um, wars through the centuries and uh, people developed a very pragmatic lifestyle is to survive in life so they they are not very into big cultural things they they are in a survival mode they they want work they want food they want a house and uh, they want to enjoy life and that's for the most part the mentality of our people here in general the the people in our area when it comes to God they're very indifferent. They, um, God practically has not uh, a high, it, this, it doesn't have a high value for most of the people um, because of their pragmatic lifestyle. I mean they want to live, there, there is not much time, there was never much time for God. It was just always a survival mode to survive in life and uh, looking back into the history of our country but also all over Europe you see I mean you have two world wars and uh, the effects of the world were the consequences of these two world wars. You could see in this indifference to, toward God because I mean it's very hard for the Germans to believe that uh, after the Second World War and even after this First World War you know that you still can believe in a God that is a God of order or of love or of justice because I mean life during the war was it was not a life of uh, justice or good life. It was a bad life. It was devastating uh, life and it was a very brutal uh, phase in our history. And after that a lot of people, they, they don't trust anymore in something like God because they are they are disappointed and uh, th their consequence of the war is that th there is no God. I mean God for them is dead, not because of, out of a philosophical worldview, you know, uh, thinking everything through and come to the conclusion, okay, I mean, uh, logically there is no God. No, I mean, in their life experience, they're, they're disappointed from God, so they give up on God. And uh, so they're very indifferent. For, for The question about God is not relevant for most of the people in our area. That makes it very hard to communicate the gospel. When you think of Germany and and Europe in general. I mean, you're talking about what we call a post-Christian society. A society that was once influenced very strongly by the Christian faith and the Christian story. Uh, and the Christian story has shaped the, the history, the structure, uh, even the laws of, of Europe very strongly. But then, I mean, through the centuries you could see a development a change. And this change was slowly, but it was consistently. Uh, I mean, in the Middle Ages, you had the church that had, was uh, was running. I mean, Europe nearly. I mean, influencing government, uh, working together with the government, and then later you have uh, you have the French Enlightenment. That uh, that was a big uh, paradigm shift uh, for European believers. You you find a more mechanistic worldview. You know. Uh, and uh, where, 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 where logic became the main center. And then um, you could see a lot of uh, philosophy coming out of it, uh, technology and, and all of these things. Great ideas, big books, I mean, uh, big dogmas and, and, and lifestyles. But then there comes the First World War, the disillusion. Of, uh, of of this mechanistic worldview, and then and, and then the second world uh, world uh, war, and afterwards you could see uh, Germany and many other countries in in, in Europe became very uh, cautious when it comes to these big ideas, because when you look back in our history, I mean, Germany and other European countries were were very big on, on theology and ideology and psychological stuff and big philosophical ideas, big uh, complex systems who explains lives and, and, and they all appeared like as very objective. Uh, but then you find out through the wars and after that these big ideas didn't save us. You see a lot of people of asking questions like what is the purpose of life, the meaning of life. Now it doesn't mean that they are looking for God 
but they're looking for something more. And I think there is a great opportunity for us as Christians. Now the sad thing is, they're not coming to the Christian church and knocking at the door and asking that question. So they don't expect the Christians to give an answer. And that's, I think, because of the failure sometimes of the church in the past. If you ask a German, you know, what, what happens if you die? Well, many Germans have a problem with that question because 40% of the German population are pragmatic atheists. They don't believe that there's anything after life. So that question doesn't work for them because they immediately will say, I don't care because nothing happens after life. Jesus in the Italian context generally is a known figure. Um, so he will be the object of scorn. Uh, he'll be the object of uh, lucky charms. So uh, if you are about to do something, you ask protection from Jesus or one of the saints or Mary or whoever it might be. But Jesus is a popular figure. Um, and you would think that because of that, the gospel is fairly well known in the context and that you know the Italians will respond to the gospel. But if you then look at the other side of, uh, of the situation, you find that mm, about 1% of the population uh, have a profound identification with the gospel of Jesus. Now that doesn't mean they're all believers, but they're connected some way uh, to the gospel. Um, but the vast majority, they have no idea uh, what the gospel is. Uh, they have no idea about the biblical uh, truth of the gospel. So when you talk about redemption, when you talk about uh, the value of Jesus' sacrifice and the application to us as individuals, uh, there's gross ignorance. And so traditionally, obviously with Catholicism being so dominant, um, Jesus becomes a byword. And so everybody talks about him, everybody believes in him. So if you ask a, an average Italian, are you a Christian? Especially down in the South, where I come from, uh, they will say, well, what's the alternative? You know, am I, am I an animal? Because the word Christian has become synonymous with human being. Um, and so they think they're Christians because they're born in a Christian country, they're baptized after a few days, and because they go to a Christian church, um, what they define a Christian church. But the gospel is just not there. Many people have never heard in their lives once a full presentation of grace. It's been a works, an operational aspect of religion, a, a meritorious, an achievement aspect of religiosity that they know of. So I have to prove myself before a very heavy-handed father, an image of the father that's very distant, uh, very far away, uh, very hard to reach, and very angry. And so I would, I contend that there is no gospel in the culture in Italy. And so the challenge is to really bring the culture of gospel, the gospel, the presentation of the gospel, and redemption as, as the message of hope in what is a very depressed climate. Uh, and, and so the culture here, some of the values which have emerged in this context are, you know, tremendous materialism, secularism, and, and strangely enough, paradoxically, whereas in the South religion is more dominant, in the North it's become far less pronounced. And so in the North there's a pushback against traditional religion. So even the concept of God, uh, many people would profess some kind of Christian faith but most would not practically believe in a, in a personal God, maybe in some kind of spirit force or some new Eastern religion or Eastern interpretation of it. But in terms of uh, the traditional values of Catholicism in, the, in the, the most Catholic way you can think about it, it's, that's really not as dominant. So, so the culture here in the north of Italy is really changing. And I think one, one element which has really impacted the culture and is impacting the culture is this uh, multiculturalism. It's difficult to put your finger and say, well, this is the Italian culture, because it's so, it's so uh, dynamic and so changing. Uh, and, and again, with Western globalization, globalization, which is another interesting element, things are, are, are really difficult to define in that point of time. So it's very diverse, and I think this cultural openness and interest and curiosity um, has, has, has been uh, an opportunity for a lot of things to come into Italy and to create a very confused scene, even from a spiritual perspective. The average Italian is, um, is quite ignorant of, the, of what evangelicals are. They have misconceptions or preconceived ideas. So they, they, they conjecture that uh, if, if you're an evangelical, you are uh, simply somebody who doesn't believe in the Pope, who rejects the figure of Mary, and who, who essentially is a Protestant. 
and so they will connect you up historically with the account that they know of history uh, of somebody of a group that just protests against the papacy so rarely do you get um, an intelligent conversation with people who are knowledgeable on what evangelicals are and unfortunately the evangelical church in Italy is quite divided and fragmented and so we have a limited amount of united front that we can present to the public and say well this is uh, this is who we are. This is the evangelical movement. We are the ones who believe in the gospel of grace and we're just not at that point. So it is difficult to, to say how an Italian will react to the gospel because, or to the, to, to the evangelicals because it doesn't know what the evangelicals are. Because of the background of spectator religion, so in other words, uh, within Catholicism, it's the priest that does everything virtually. And so you are used to go to church, you used to, you, you, you go to the mass, you take part, but as a passive spectator. In the normal mindset of an Italian, uh, there's a separation between clergy and laity. So in, in a sense, what happens is that the, the responsibility of discipleship falls back on a few individuals who are then overstretched. And they're the professionals, you know, who give discipleship courses and so on. And, um, but it's just not done. Uh, so it's difficult to disciple large quantities of people who then in turn disciple others. It's just not a big emphasis out there. Biblical education in Italy is lacking, to put it mildly. Um, we currently have no residential Bible colleges. Theological education is just not part of the, uh, the makeup of the average church. And the sad thing is that um, generally speaking, those who are giving Bible teaching have no training themselves uh, because again there are no there are no institutions out there uh, and apart from institutions just generally there's not a, a culture of study uh, because these are often bivocational leaders there are few Italian pastors who are you know full time and so they just don't they're running a family they're running a job uh, they're running a church and they just don't have time to stop the study it's the last minute you know you open the Bible and let's see what comes out. <laughs>I think in people's thinking, God is dead. So people, I don't know if they've got an issue in their marriage or they're stressed at work, facing redundancy or their family situation's bad or whatever it is, people aren't thinking, I need to turn to God, I need to pray, I need help. So God's not on their radar screen. And uh, I don't think it's fair to say that um, there's no interest in God in Europe. I don't think it's fair to say that at all. I think what has happened is um, the way the church has presented itself. In other words, the way people see God having presented himself through the church is something that they refuse. The, the image of God we present as a church is no longer connecting with people and perhaps it's a sense in which we need to, when we say let God die, of course we don't mean it in that literal sense, it could be quoted out of context here, but, but let the, the, the way we have presented God, perhaps as a harsh judge, um, perhaps as a, as a very distant figure, whatever it might be, that, that, that narrow and, and unhelpful understanding of God perhaps is something that has to be allowed to die so that God can again speak in, in truth and in power. I think there's a, a, some of the, the maybe the cultural assumptions that might be moving toward God is dead. Um, some of those things are backfiring and people are, are beginning to ask questions, which is, is there's a, that, that's a good, there's a, almost a plowing of the field that's happening right now. When you push in with the gospel into situations so you talk with someone about the trouble of having their marriage and you say look Christ is is a loving husband to his people um, he says that if a husband leads his wife in love then then his marriage is gonna be on a good foundation people get that here's the challenge redefine church redefine God by popular what popular impression is uh, bring the gospel lived out in the lives of people to bear on society today. Live God out. And what will that produce in Italy? Uh, I'm convinced and I'm seeing it happen in small ways, in small locations, in certain locations, that that kind of God, that kind of church, is very interesting. And so he's very much alive. He's not dead. So, Today, we, we live in a postmodern and post-Christian society, and there are many obstacles of reaching the society for Jesus. But on the other hand, there are many opportunities. I can engage in 
a, a dialogue with people about the purpose of life, the meaning of life, you know. It depends how you word it, how, how you start the conversation, how you dialogue with them, you know. You have to come close to them, spend life with them in order for them to open up and, and, and be a friend to them. When they, when they sense friendship, uh, there is a trust and when you have trust with people, you can talk about personal uh, things. And you will find out that many Germans are seeking for real life. And that's where we as Christians have to be there when they ask this question. And we have to be wise in answering and telling them uh, what the gospel really means. And on the other hand, we have to watch out that we're not just saying something. We have to live the gospel in our own life. If we talk about the meaning of life and the purpose of life, we have to live a life that has purpose and a life that has meaning. And so there, there is perhaps the need for us as Christian people to set up a, a, as role models, to, to be living lives which are not just looking kind of weird uh, and which are not just looking kind of, oh no, there's a rule against that, you know, uh, uh, but, but, but living life which are which is just part of the culture, which are sharing. Uh, and I see more and more of, of, I think, European evangelical movements doing that, that, that they're not bound by rules, they're not terribly stuffy about doctrine, they're, they're sitting around cafes chatting with people and, and being part of the culture. And I think that's going to be a key to breaking down whatever, however we might understand the barriers. In some ways it's hard because we see Christian values in society being eroded and you see that doing damage to people and damage to society. But in another sense it makes the gospel, the kind of diamond of the gospel of Christ shine more brightly because the, the back cloth is darker. And at the same time, uh, those of us who have the, this vision of what the gospel can mean for us, trying to find ways to, to communicate that in the culture with the same sort of hopefully dynamism uh, and energy that, that Calvin and the others were doing back in their time. I keep looking back to that as a model because I think socially the level of changes which they were facing are perhaps matched by the, the level and the pace of change which we are living uh, in the midst of at the moment. What we need in Italy is, is a reversal of this DNA which is passive and spectator sport and we need the development of a missional DNA. So the people no longer see themselves as simply the beneficiaries of the gospel, but they see themselves as the ones who have the responsibility to take the gospel, live it out, and then bring it to others. So this missional emphasis, uh, as I've grown up here, uh, I've seen that it's just not happening. The church has to stop waiting for people to come into the church. We have to go to the people. And that can be in many very different uh, ways. I do generally sense that God is doing something quite significant in terms of raising up indigenous um, people um, as, as missionaries to our culture. And um, you know, we very much see mission as being that. We don't see mission as just being an overseas endeavor, but you know, it's, it's home and abroad. And um, so, you know, we're very much encouraged by that. We're very much encouraged by just the substance that God is working in people's lives, individuals that we're looking at and we're saying, praise God, there's character, the strength of character, there's a great grasp of the gospel truths and great potential to commit to these individuals and see them carry that. So it's a, it's a process which I think should be on, ongoing. There should be a culture of change within the church so that we're no longer content to use terminology which is standardized, but we are careful to make sure that what we're saying is understood. So it's a process, but we have to be taking everything, putting it on the table. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? Uh, and who is doing it? Because maybe we should be recruiting people, even from other countries, to come and help. Uh, from Italy itself, raising up leaders and uh, evangelists and visionaries and, uh, and missionaries. Uh, to be able to take these new terms, or these old terms, and give new definition and then live them out in practice. So it's a process which is not easy, but which I think is very necessary. Well, I think because Norwich is such a place that, as I said, it was voted the most godless place to live, that, that means that there's a, a myriad of opportunities to make disciples. And, and I think that is, the, 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 if you want to boil down the, the purpose of the church, it is to be disciples who make disciples. Reaching out to people starts not in doing something for them, it's something that you have to change your thinking. 
And I think that's a challenge for many of the churches because in a postmodern society where everything is just floating and there are no absolutely truth, the church sometimes has a tendency to, to draw back and to shelter itself. But I think in our thinking, in our, in, in, in our attitude, we have to break through that fear and, and see that even behind the immoral life is, is a soul that is longing for God. There are people who uh, are wanting to know what is real and wanting to know what is, is there such thing as what's true and, and what is beyond what we can see and taste and, and touch. And, and so, yes, the, the real challenge for us as, as Christian communities, and in a sense, I, I feel as if I'm sort of uh, on, on, on both stools because my church is one of the historic churches with a whole history going right back to John Knox and the Westminster Confession, the Scots Confession. We, we have that great privilege of building on, on the faith of people who've gone before and laid that very solid foundation. But a solid foundation also keeps you from moving quickly as the culture moves quickly so, so there's that challenge for us to to hold on to hold on to the faith make sure we're not just presenting something that's trendy in order to be popular make sure it's not a watered down gospel we're presenting people with take up your cross and follow me it's not come to jesus and everything will be wonderful it, it, it's a life of self-sacrifice which opens up the, the holy spirit within us to, to hold on to that and yet to present it in a way which people can relate to, um, to present it in a way which is not that it's all about old people and, and very stuffy people and, and very dull people. We have our share of those, let's be honest, but the, the, the challenge always is to say, look, that this, this is what life's all about. This is life in all its fullness. And if you're ready to engage with this and, and to try living this, then you find it. But if, as soon as you start to talk about Christianity, people only see the caricatures, it's hard for them to get through that. And it's hard for us as the church to get through that. What we need here is a theologically driven church, which is informed, which is clear on, uh, you know, on what God is doing. I think especially going in to help the local leaders of local churches uh, become informed so that they can then teach the Bible effectively to the ordinary person who can then in turn teach it to somebody else. And this chain effect I think would be the way forward. You know, Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I believe that to be a metaphor speaking ultimately of death. And so the church ain't dead and it's never gonna die because we're Christ's and he is the life of the church. And so, albeit there may be a remnant, albeit it may be a smaller contingent, there is a contingent of healthy, hearty Christian representation in the UK. Um, it's diminished, there's no two ways about that. It's, it, it's in a much, much smaller minority than what it may have been in the past. But um, the church is alive and um, the gospel is being forwarded. And so whilst um, the, the, the environment, whilst society does seem darker, there's greater opposition to the gospel than there's ever been. Um, you know, we recognise where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. It's, just, it's almost as if it's designed to just to, to encourage us. The gospel is still true, it still works, it still changes people's lives. And, and, and almost as a church community, we need to keep being reminded of that, that you know, we are not fighting a losing battle here. We may be swimming against the tide of history at the moment, where we are and when we are, but that's just a very small part of a much bigger story. Some say the church is future is bleak, battered and beat, wounded and weak, half asleep, at night she creeps. Purity she no longer keeps, with loose lips all kind of dribble she leaks and sinks ships, but hear the cry. The bride of Jesus Christ is still alive, the apple of his eye he'll never let die. Though Satan tries bringing false doctrine from within and persecution to scorch our skin from without, we're still stout. We still bling, lost souls we still win, the Lion of Judah conquering like our brethren, blazed in the heat at Nero's feet like meat, they were flossed from between lion's teeth, yet stood strong, singing their song, and in that same valiant mode of victory we're pressing on, beating our chests like King Kong, here screaming bring it on, by grace we're running this race like a stallion. Not for gold or platinum, nor for no medallions, but only so we'll look in God's face and hear him say well done. From first millennium till kingdom come, the church is marching on and on and on.